Hi, everybody. We're at the World Press Freedom Day. Uh, we're just waiting for Mikko Hyppänen to start his keynote. Um, probably won't take long since it's already 2 o'clock. And the event should be starting soonish. So now you just get to look at the stage and also a bit of the audience and enjoy the time before Mikko starts his keynote. Not going to be long, I promise you. And by the way, it's pretty awesome because uh, you're almost like in the front row watching his keynote. Not everybody gets to do that. And we're also going to see if we can get Mikko for a short interview after his keynote. So there's thousands of, of journalists actually gathered at, at um, Finlandia Hall Helsinki for the World Press Freedom Day to celebrate the World Press Freedom. Shortly after Mikko's panel, there will also be held, uh, after Mikko's keynote, there will also be held a panel. And I said, ah, sorry, I'm sorry, I missed your name. Still waiting. Hang on there online. We'll be on shortly for the keynote. Obviously, you still have people coming in here. So far, it's been a, a very nice event. There's hugely interesting stories to be told about journalists who've been traveling to, to especially crisis areas to do their reporting and let the rest of the world know what's happening in there. Um, also, photographers who are sharing their stories. Um, if you have the time, you should absolutely, absolutely go and um, check out more stories on the World Press Freedom Day website at UNESCO.
Sorry to keep you waiting, guys, online. The keynote will start shortly. Now, after the keynote, you could also be sending us some questions on Twitter if there is something you're interested in, in uh, hearing directly from Mikko himself. We'll try to catch him for a few questions before he has to run to the next place. Seems like we're running a bit late in the schedules. As always with conferences, the timetables might not hold as well, and we're running a bit late here on World Press Freedom Day. Nico will start his keynote shortly. I think the game is on. getting set to start the session. Hello, assembled guests, ladies and gentlemen, delegates. This, I understand, is the most attended World Press Freedom Day uh, yet. Uh, it is great to be here 250 years since the first Declaration of Freedom of Information, which was uh, created, signed, and, 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 and Im implemented into law on the territory of what is now modern-day Sweden and Finland. I hope I've got that right. So it's great to be in Helsinki, particularly, and we thank the Finnish government for their invitation. 
Um, it's wonderful to have this distinguished panel, and particularly our keynote speaker, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. And our particular panel is about protecting your rights, or protecting people's rights, and online censorship. That is something that really affects our lives as citizens and our lives as, as journalists and lives, you know, for those in government and, and elsewhere as well. But before I do that, I would like to draw everybody's attention, both in this room and outside this room. So whoever wants to tweet, to post, to create as much of a storm as possible on the idea of freeing, protecting, respecting our journalists and our press and our colleagues who are now in jail. One of the great opportunities that I have as UNESCO Google Ambassador for the freedom of, of, of expression and safety of journalists is that uh, I am very grateful to be able to have this platform to be able to lobby for and, and work for uh, the freedom of our colleagues who are hauled in behind bars often for no reason whatsoever in these very draconian political climates in certain countries around the world. And right now we have a lot of journalists in, in jail, which we're going to highlight. People who've been harassed, intimidated, and as I said, in many cases, wrongfully arrested just for doing their job. And as we know, and as I've said many, many times, journalism, it is not a crime. It is actually a great aid for civil society and the furtherance of democracy. So, us lot, we are here to help the world, not to hinder the world. And the backlash against journalists today is, is really unacceptable, and sadly it is growing. They're, as I say, often locked up on trumped up charges, held with no recourse to the rule of law. Governments and civil society, along with UNESCO and the UN system, do have a role to play in raising awareness of this issue. The US State Department has highlighted several such cases in their annual Free the Press campaign. For instance, Jose Antonio Torres is in jail in Cuba. Mohamed Bekyanov in Uzbekistan. Mohamed Sidir Kabuvand in Iran. Sergei Reznik in Russia. Mehmet Jan Abdullah in China. Wubishet Taye in Ethiopia. And those are just a few. I also am an honorary member now. I've been a member for a long time on the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists, and I've worked with them for many, many years. Um, a few years ago, I, as part of another activist committee uh, for journalism, the International um, IWMF, the International Women's Media Foundation, gave a prize to Khadija Ismailova for her brave reporting on her country as Azerbaijan. Today, Khadija is, is, is in jail. Uh, she was the winner of this year's UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Day Prize. She's an investigative journalist, as we all know. She has been reporting with RFE, RL in Azerbaijan. She's known for her very courageous reporting on corruption and uh, on the ruling family. She's been accused of embezzlement, tax evasion, abuse of power, and she's been sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. Today, as I said, is her 516th day in prison, and here from this stage, I personally, and I'm sure many of you will join me, in calling on the Azerbaijan government to free her. That is what should be done, because she is just a civilian wielding a pen and paper, perhaps some social media tools, and doing her job, which is shining light in dark corners and being everybody's eyes and ears when it comes to knowing the world and figuring out what's going on. There's also Mahmoud Abu Zaid, who's better known as Shao Khan. He's a freelance photojournalist who is currently imprisoned in Egypt. He was detained August 14, 2013, while he was covering those clashes now famous during the dispersal of the pro-Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood sit-ins uh, in Cairo. Today marks his 994th day in prison. And again, we call, I call on the Egyptian government to do for him what they did to our other colleagues, the journalists from Al Jazeera who were finally freed. This is a good example of what can be done 
and how uh, disagreements and misunderstandings can be cleared up with talk, with inter uh, you know, interface and with mediation, how those of us in this platform and elsewhere can help open the eyes perhaps and explain some of what our journalists are doing and explain that they are not uh, evildoers or, or anti-state crusaders, they are simply activists uh, and crusaders for the truth. So I hope that um, Mahmoud Abu Zaid will also be free. And finally, Mohammed Sheikh Oud Mohammed, a blogger and freelancer in Mauritania, he was convicted and sentenced to death for apostasy in 2014 for an article he wrote. In that article, he criticized the caste system in his country, and he said that followers of Islam interpreted the religion according to circumstance. Later, he apologized for that. Last month, though, an appeals court upheld his conviction, and he has just one appeal left before it gets, uh, and that appeal is before the Supreme Court. So, again, we must do more. We appeal again to the authorities and the government of Mauritania to make sure that he is free, and not to mix up political and religious disagreements with, uh, with, 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 and make those a punishable crime. So, Here's some good news though, after a whole load of lobbying, we are joined in this plenary with, by two alumni of the list of those who once were in jail. Um, they, the State Department and IREX Europe have brought Abbas Zainalov and Natalia Radzina to celebrate their freedom. They stand up right now, let's give them a hand. <laughs> teaching at the State University, serving as an advisor to the Consumer Office of the Ministry of Justice and also to the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. So a very important point of view from him. Uh, then next to him, Christian Guillaume Fernandez, Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Re Representative of the great country of Costa Rica, which I've had the pleasure to visit and love it. He is the representative to the UN in Geneva. Uh, and he has broad experience in these multilateral affairs that are needed when it comes to uh, this kind of, of topic. Lina Atala, the co-founder and chief editor of Mada Masser in Egypt, uh, and she, this is a Cairo-based news website that, in her words, attempts to secure a house for a dislocated practice of journalism that did not survive in mainstream organizations and their associated political and economic conditions. She's written widely, and we do know that there is, uh, as we just mentioned, to a large extent, a great crisis in journalism in Egypt, and it presumably gets even more intense when it comes to uh, online. Marice Shaka, member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands, and she's been serving as, a, uh, as I said, a member of the Euro European Parliament since 2009. She is the ALDE coordinator of the International Trade Committee and the spokesman for the ALD Group on Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So, very, very important voice on this because she is strongly committed to an open internet in discussions, uh, including how it works for governance. 
And then close to me, Rebecca McKinnon, who I know best as my former colleague at CNN. She was in charge first of our Beijing bureaus and then in, in, uh, in Tokyo. And she has since left and she's now the project director, ranking digital rights. It's based in the US. And you know how uh, certain uh, organizations rank countries in terms of freedom and other such issues? Well, her project that she is now directing ranks corporations. And she's also an author, she's a media activist, and she has been at the, I'm going to get it wrong, uh, well, now you're at the Annenberg School, right? First yeah. you were. Okay, great. So she has a huge amount of, of expertise, and actually, if I remember, was one of the first to come out and start writing about the challenges of our digital work and the opportunities. So, Nico, with no further ado, let's have your keynote speech. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you to all of you for being here in my hometown, Helsinki. My name is Mikko Hyppönen and I hunt hackers. I hunt hackers for a living. I hunt hackers, the evil kind of hackers, the criminal hackers, not the good hackers, the white hat hackers who actually try to secure our technology. Not the evil hackers who will try to steal our money or who will try to steal our privacy. And I love the internet. I think it's the best innovation our generation has done. However, it's quite clear that it has also brought us completely new kinds of risks. Before the internet, we only had to worry about criminals who were living in our city. Now, today, because of the internet, we have to worry about criminals who can be anywhere in the world. But don't get me wrong, it's quite clear that the internet has brought us more good than bad. The internet has brought us so much connectivity, so much business, so much entertainment, that the bad signs it has created pale in comparison. And I would like to think that exactly the same thing will apply to the revolution which is underway right now, which is what we call the internet of things where all our appliances will be connected to the internet. You can think about the internet of things in a way that any device that we use to connect to the electricity grid, we will in the future connect to the electricity grid and to the internet grid. So your toasters, your washing machines, everything will be online. And yes, that will bring completely new kinds of risks but I hope it will bring us more benefits than risks, just like the internet itself did. So I've been doing this now for 25 years. And during those 25 years, I've seen the bad sides of the internet. I've seen the growth of online organized crime and the, all the kinds of ways organized criminals make hundreds of millions and billions in profit, in criminal profit with attacks like banking trojans and ransom trojans and credit card debt with keyloggers and on and on. But right now, over the last couple of years, the biggest changes in this field have not been with online crime. They've been with governments entering the offensive cyber attack business. Governments using malware, governments using hacking, to do intelligence gathering and to wage war. And this is a major development because we are the first generation in mankind's history who can be tracked throughout their lives through technology. We are the first generation that can be tracked like this. And we don't really understand what that actually means. What does that actually imply? When Third parties can monitor where we are, where do we travel, who do we communicate with, what do we communicate about. And it's not just governments that can do this kind of tracking, there's several third parties that can actually do it. And this is a clear problem. We don't really see what this will mean in the long run. Now, obviously governments do intelligence gathering because that's why they have intelligence agencies. And some intelligence agents have described 
problems they have today in doing their work because of encryption that we have on our devices, encryption technologies, strong end-to-end -end encryption. We saw this discussion, for example, between FBI and Apple just last month. Some intelligence agencies have, have described this problem as living in the dark ages of intelligence gathering because they can't see what's being discussed because of encryption. And that's not true. We are not living in the dark ages of intelligence gathering. We are living in the golden age of intelligence gathering. So much metadata is being leaked from our devices, from our computers, from our smartphones and tablets, all the time as we use it. Yes, a small part of that is encrypted end-to-end, -end, which cannot be read because of the technology protecting it. But vast amounts of information and metadata is being leaked and collected about our daily lives. It is not the dark ages, it is the golden ages. And to protect our privacy in the online world, we have to rely on technology. Now, we cannot make strong encryption go away. No matter what intelligence agencies or governments say, they cannot really regulate strong encryption. They cannot really outlaw strong encryption. Why? Because strong encryption is math. It's mathematics. And that math those mathematic algorithms have been invented. They have been published. You can go to any library today and get a book which will describe to you how to create strong end-to-end -end encryption mechanisms. How strong? Well, so strong that a single message encrypted with strong encryption mechanism cannot be decrypted. Or actually, it can be decrypted, but the decryption process is so slow that even if you would collect every single computer on the planet and you would use the power of every computing device we have to track one single message, they would eventually crack it. But it would take close to a hundred million years to complete the crack. And in hundred million years, your messages don't matter anymore. <laughs> so strong encryption, as technology is known, we can't make it go away. So if we outlaw strong encryption, then we, normal people, will not have protection. But the bad people will still have it. If you outlaw encryption, then only outlaws will have So I work at F-Secure. We try to provide security and privacy to people. We protect thousands and thousands of journalists while they do their daily work. One thing that how we do that is with VPN solutions that people can run on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers. And here I'd like to announce to all of you that we have, especially for this event, we're not providing a free VPN license of our Freedom VPN to every single journalist here today to help you make your work. You can visit our booth here to look at it. Another service that we are providing here is that, is that we actually have forensics experts on location. So if you're worried about your device, if you're worried whether you might have some kind of bugging device in it or some software that follows your work, we have specialists here. You can actually go there, give your device for a checkup, and we will see if there's any, any problems on your device to give you that piece of mind. Because we want to support your work. Because we want to support privacy. Because we believe in privacy. And the reason why we believe in privacy is that without privacy, we can't have <coughs> free press. And without free press, we cannot have democracy. And without democracy, we can't have freedom. So thank you for your work. Miku, thank you very much. That uh, is incredibly tantalizing and obviously would have loved to have heard a lot more. Um, but I think we can pick up the points that you raised and, and deconstruct them and discuss them anyway. Um, on, on Thank you, everybody, for joining first, online. We're going to quit here. Thanks for joining online. For me, obviously.